Good morning, Digital Cathedral family. Glad you're with me this morning. Trust you had an awesome week and you've come to the Digital Cathedral this morning to get prepared to have even a better one this coming week. I'm glad you're with me this morning. And as always, I guess it's the pastor in me. I'd like to welcome all of you that are here for the very first time. It's an honor and a privilege. I'm not sure how you found out about us, but we're glad that you're here. And for those of you that are regulars at the Digital Cathedral, you're what it's all about because we're on a journey together and we're discovering some unbelievable, fantastic things. I don't know about you, but I am growing in wisdom and stature and favor with God and with man. There seems like there's so many things happening today that are just mind-blowing for me. Fantastic. Doors opening, things happening. And I trust that you're finding some of the same in your life also. I want to begin over at 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. And I love the way the Passion Translation says this. And it kind of lays out where we have gone the last couple of weeks. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we're going to kind of take a little directional change this morning, but I'm I'm being very foundational right now. We did a we did a deep dive into immortality. And it seems like I love the deep dives. Don't get me wrong. I love to deep dive. I like new truth. I like, I like the Spirit of God to reveal to us mysteries and truth in a way that we never have seen before. But I also realize the importance of the fundamentals, of the foundations. And every time I teach on, on nuts and bolts, that's what I call it, nuts and bolts, the basics, it seems like I, I grab something new and it becomes more cemented, if I can say it that way, or maybe planted would be better, planted within me, and it begins to grow profusely. And the fruit that I desire automatically comes without the stress, the pull, the tug, that characterize trying to grow spiritually back in my religious church days. So I like the way Peter puts this. And Peter, I think, felt a little bit like me this morning. When he wrote 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, he said this. He said, I won't hesitate to continually remind you of the truth. Remind you. That means they knew it. But he's coming along and he's enforcing it. He's reinforcing it. That's, that's such an important uh, step in our growth is that we continually, perpetually have the truth reinforced. Even though you are aware of it and are well established in the present measure of truth that you have already embraced. So Peter is saying, look guys, let me put the Keithley translation on this. Peter is saying, look guys, there's some truth that I know that you've embraced, you've heard, but I'm going to, I'm going to remind you of it. I'm going to continue to remind you of it. And I'm going to remind you of it again, because every time I remind you, the spirit of truth is going to come in and pull back the, the cover just a little bit more, or if you want a visualization, he's going to take another layer off the onion, right? And you can't, you can't get to where there's not another layer of the onion to uncover. That's just the way the spirit of truth works. So I don't, I don't uh, apologize. I don't back up from teaching some things that some of you are going to say, well, I've heard this before. I know about that. No, you don't. Open up your mind and your heart and let the spirit take you down even farther than he ever has before on some things that you may say, I, I have a grasp of that. Well, you're going to get a more firm, firm grasp than what you had this morning. Peter said present truth. There is a lot of present truth going on right now. And because you're on the cutting edge of where the Father is going, most of the present truth you're familiar with. If I were to characterize, if I were to sum up what I think the Father is, is doing in, in one simple uh, truth statement, I think that the call of this hour, I think the current word of the Lord is, of which many of the truths that we're embracing come under this umbrella, I think that it's without a doubt, I think it's the revealing, the unveiling, and the boldness now that is coming out in the manifested sons of God. And as this unveiling, revealing boldness comes out, we're starting to understand really that we are as Jesus is in this present world. I had lunch with Malcolm Smith about, uh, I guess by the time you see this, probably last week, week before, on a Friday, he came to, to Houston. And we spent about three, four hours together. Our lunches, we, we have to really tip the waitress well because we just type a table all afternoon. We, we talked about so much, so much theology and so much truth. And 
it's an honor really to spend time with Malcolm. I, I thoroughly enjoy it. I'll drop whatever I'm doing if I have a chance to be with him or Steve McVeigh, either one. Great guys. I asked Malcolm, I said, Malcolm, what, what is the depth of the new creation? If the new creation were to totally hit the depth of what it is intended to hit, what do you think it would look like? He didn't hesitate. He said it would look exactly like Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think I'm, I'm reflecting everything of Jesus yet. So as I walk you through some things this week and next week, it's going to take me two weeks. As I walk you through some things about manifesting as a son, I don't want you to say, I already got it. No, I want you, I want you to know that there are some strings that he's going to cut. There's some ties and bonds that maybe have held you back a little bit from full manifestation. There's a, there's a, there's a wave going on right now. It seems like about every 500 years, there is, there's a huge push forward. Uh, you know, the early church fathers, the first 500 years of the church, really got us very Christ-centered, very uh, Christocentric in their approach and in their teaching. Oh, there was, there was some, there was some uh, quibbling back and forth on doctrine, but I think what really came out of, out of the early church to me was the message of being Christocentric. Then through, then through the years, there have been different waves that have come in with the Reformation um, in, what, 1500s? And then I think in the 1900s, we had a revival on Azusa Street that brought the Holy Spirit to the front where the, the Reformation brought uh, justification by faith. I would say that was probably the message. And so now here we are in 2023. And um, I think we're, we're coming through a season right now that the Holy Spirit is kind of sweeping up all of the all of the the understanding from days gone by, and the Spirit of Truth is beginning to bring together what has been shown to us, much of what we have not been aware of, much of what we have not explored in any depth. I think the Spirit of Truth is beginning to bring together the things that we have had given to us and shown to us over the last fifteen hundred years. He's showing glimpses. He's showing some beginning understanding of how to bring it together and to walk like Jesus in the earth. I don't know about you, but that's a passion of mine. I want to be like him. Uh, and I guess maybe uh, that, that sounds a little bit religious. Maybe I, I want to I come at a place where he and I are in absolute full union. That I can say if you've seen him, you've seen me where everything that I do is a, is a total reflection of him. So there's no question. I'm, I'm addressing some of you this morning. There's no question it's time for some of us to come out of the closet and begin to show who we are and manifest as sons of God. And I don't think with everything going on in our world today, politically, socially, economically, um, it seems like on every front, every, every time we get up in the morning, there's something else going on. But I don't think there has ever been a time, at least in my lifetime, when the opportunity has been more um, more in the in the forefront to advance the kingdom. It's an ever increasing kingdom. That's what the scripture says. That's what your Bible says. It's an ever increasing kingdom. I don't think there's ever been a greater time to to expose the kingdom to the culture we live in, and I don't think there's been a greater time to advance as a manifested son of God. You you you're safe and coming out of the closet now. 15, 20 years ago. When I first came out with this message, it wasn't very safe. You got riddled every time you, you opened your mouth. Now there's a wave going on. There's, there's thousands upon hundreds of thousands of people that are awakening to the truth. It's safe to come out of the closet. Uh, I'm speaking to some of you pastors right now that pastor churches. I had to come out. I remember well standing before my church and saying, guys, you know what? I've been wrong about some things. I'm seeing some truth. I'm seeing uh, some understanding that I've never had before and I want to share it. Well, some, some are glad to get it, but most are not glad to get it. But that is turning today. If you're pastoring a church, I would just say this. Turn the ship slowly. Uh, you spend hours studying something, but when you go over on that Sunday morning, those people have been working all week. They have not spent the time in prayer and study that you have, contemplation, meditation, to be able to grasp probably the depth of what you're going to bring. Uh, I mean, I do that at the Digital Cathedral. I spend a lot of time getting a message ready. It probably takes me without exaggerate, without evangelistically speaking, it probably takes me 25 hours, sometimes more than that, to, to get the teaching ready for you on Sunday morning. So I spend, I spend a lot of time in prep, 
right? I spent a lot of time in prep. I prep one, one message a week, which keeps me a little bit ahead. I've worked ahead a little bit. So I prep one mes message a week, deliver one message a week, do the secret place, which now is expanding to the, the book study on religion busters, which by the way, side note, if you <clears throat> have not come over to the Don Keith Lee ministry page and joined us on Wednesday night for that religious buster study, you, you're missing it. I'm telling you, missing it. It's good. I'd like to see you over there. So get the book on Amazon. Come on over. Join the join that private group and let's study together. All right. I, this this is a day. This is a day that the previous generations I think have been looking for without a doubt. It's a day when everything that can be shaken is shaken. Isn't it amazing how how the shaking from from the government to the stock market to to our culture. Everything to religion. Religion's in a heap of trouble if you haven't figured it out yet. The evangelical church is sucking air right now. They're losing members. They're losing credibility. Uh, things are being exposed like we're doing on the religion busters. It's happening on a worldwide, worldwide stage right now. They're in trouble. Everything that can be shaken is to be shaken. This is, this is what previous generations have been looking for. Over, over in Hebrews chapter 12, I... I, I don't want you to think you're alone in this, and I like to emphasize that once in a while because it's easy to get to feeling like we are by ourselves. But look what it says, Hebrews chapter 12 and, and verse 1. Hebrews chapter 12, got my page stuck together here. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, I, got a, I, got a, I don't want to say a vision, but I got a visualization of what that looked like. We're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. And what I saw was me walking out into a, a, a football stadium. Like if you're in Michigan, like the one in East Lansing or Ann Arbor, uh, if you're in Texas at UT or A&M, walking into this huge football stadium that seats thousands of people, 100,000 people. I saw me walking out into the center of that. And as I looked up into the stands, it was full. And it was full of the cloud of witnesses. And they were, they were cheering and saying, go for it. Don't, don't back up. You're doing good. We're with you. You're, you're helping to complete what we started. And I want you to feel that same exhilaration. I don't know if you've ever any played any kind of sports, but even in high school, where there was not near that kind of crowd, when you go onto the field, whether it was football, basketball, baseball, what it was, and the crowd was cheering, I'm telling you what, it, it, has, it has an effect on you. And I want you to see that cloud of witness. I want you to know you're not by yourself this morning. When you begin to manifest as a son, you may have some people rebuff it, reject it, say you're going down a slippery slope, uh, you're going to hell because you don't believe in hell. Isn't that crazy? I want you to know you're not by yourself. I saw this cloud of witness. It really encouraged me, it really encouraged me. I saw Paul sitting there, I saw Peter. You know, if there's anybody I'd like to have an encounter with, it would be Paul. I'd like to talk to Paul for a while. Let us lay aside every weight and that's what we're doing right now. As we come through these foundations, these nuts and bolts, what's going to be exposed are still some weights that are hanging on us to the things. I'm going to give you three things, one, two this week, one next week, that begin to prevail as we manifest as the Son of God. Very basic. You're going to have to grab onto these and begin to develop them and practice them. That's the purpose of, of fundamentals. Football, basketball, I don't care what you play, tennis, golf, Guys go to the driving range, hit hundreds of balls just to get the swing down right. Because if the swing is a little bit wrong, you're going to hook, you're going to slice, you're not going to hit the ball where you want to hit it. It takes practice. And these fundamentals that we're going over right now, since, since we did uh, the series on immortality, have been very basic, and I realize that. I'm perfecting your swing. <laughs> I'm teaching you to, to, to tackle, to run, to swing a bat. I'm teaching you how to do that in a better fashion because I want you to manifest to your fullness. My challenge, my call is to get you to the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. And to get you there, I got to get there first. A good leader is ahead of who he leads, but he's not so far ahead that people lose sight. I don't want, I don't want you to lose sight of me. We're coming on this journey together, right? Some of you are leaders in your city. You're leaders in a home group. You're leaders in a church. Don't get so far ahead that the people can't see or can't comprehend, but you need to stay ahead. And the way you stay ahead is getting these foundations down and getting these, these practicals functioning fully in your life. So he said, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. 
right? And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher or the perfecter. So somewhere in between him, him initiating or starting it, authoring your faith and finishing it, that's where you are this morning. So I want to take the needle and push it a little bit more toward the finish. I want him to be able to speak as me this morning straight to you. And I want what I say to resonate with you so that you can move the ball down the field just a little bit. All right. We've got a wonderful covenant, you guys. It's a fantastic covenant. It's been, it's been signed. It's been sealed. It's been delivered. It's a covenant that belongs to us as manifesting sons and daughters. It's not a covenant we have with God. I know that that's what they taught you in church. Covenant was not made with God and man. That was an old covenant. The new covenant, what makes it so unbreakable, what makes it so impeccable, is that the new covenant was made between the Father and the Son. Actually, if you look under, under just a little bit, God made a covenant with himself. That way it cannot be annulled, cannot be broken. So you and I, as manifesting sons of God, here's our job. Here's what we want to do. We want to expose our world, our culture to the kingdom of God, and we want to let them know what is in the covenant that has been freely given to them. The covenant was made between the Father and the Son, and Paul says that we have an inheritance. So we inherited what was in the covenant that was made between the Father and Son. So like I said, this morning, this week, I'm talking, I'm talking foundations. But don't look at it as foundations. Look at it as a big open door to take a step into the next phase of your manifestation. Now, before I really get into what I want to lay out for you, two things this morning, one next week. I want to ask you five questions because maybe you need to adjust your sight. Maybe you need to adjust your perception. I want to ask you five questions. Number one, what in your view, when you think of a manifested son of God, what do you think of? All right. Number two, when you, when you see a manifested son of God, what are you going to see? Question number three, is being a manifested son of God for everybody or is it just for a select elite few? It's just the fivefold ministry manifested sons of God. They're supposed to show the rest of us, or is it for everybody else? Question number four, what does a manifested son of God do? And I'm going to get into that big time heavy next week because I want you to know what, what your mission is. And number five, how does one begin the walk of a manifested son of God? All right. Now, there's a, there's a couple of verses it's his equipping you. Let me say that. That's kind of a bottom. It's his equipping you. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as being from ourselves. Right? So everything we're doing is Christ-centered. It's Christocentric. It does not come from us. Everything that we live out, every revelation we get, every truth that we experience comes from the Christ that is within. I, I don't take credit for any of it, and you don't either. That's part of what we're developing. Our sufficiency is not of ourselves to think anything as from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. Well, when you're a manifesting son of God, I could probably answer all five of these questions just out of these two verses. So if you want to meditate, contemplate something this week, I'd suggest you go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and think about verses 5 and 6. Just go out on the back porch. Sunset. I, I like in the evenings. I love to go out on the back porch in the evenings. When the sun is going down, it's cool. And just think. Just think. Just roll over. Just contemplate. So he said, the sufficiency is not of ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. Watch. Who also made us sufficient ministers of the new covenant. Now, the sufficient minister of the new covenant is going to be one that manifests as a son. That's what, that's what makes you a sufficient minister of the new covenant. He said, not of the letter, but of the spirit. We're learning how to go by spirit. N not of the letter, because the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Oh, I, I want to stop there so bad. A manifested son of God does not minister death. He ministers life. 
So that's going to eliminate just a lot of what you hear at church or used to hear at church on Sunday morning was a ministry of death. It was an old covenant. It was a mixed law and grace message. But he's given us the sufficiency. He's given you the sufficiency this morning. What does a son of, what does a manifested son of God do? Get into it next week. But let me say this. You minister life, you minister the covenant, and you point people to Jesus. Now, I tell you what, I spend hours pondering those five questions. When you, when you hear about or, or think about a manifested Son of God, what do you think about? When you see a manifested Son of God, what are you going to see? Is being a manifested Son of God for everybody or just an elite few? What does a manifested Son of God do? We just uncovered some of that. How does one begin to be a manifested son of God? I've taken hours pondering, visualizing, meditating on those five questions because I feel very strong and my, my, my mission is to manifest and then train others to manifest as well. That requires I shake all vestiges of that old religion that I was so ground in, that was so ground into me for 50 years of my life. All my higher education was in, in perfecting the dust man, this old physical boy, and then trying to kill him, right? So when I'm, done, when I'm done with this session, when I'm done next Sunday morning, I want you to be able to click off the digital cathedral, and I want you to be fully confident and fully aware that you are and you can live the life of a manifested son of God. So as I said, we're gonna look at three things from the life of Jesus, who is the pattern son, who is the one that we're going to live after, three things that will move you upward in consciousness and awareness, because that's really, that's really what it's about right now. It's an it's a, it's a elevation in consciousness, perception, awareness. Now, before I get into these three, let me just say this. <clears throat> the one that manifested perfectly, Jesus, the overriding principle of what I'm going to get into, he expressed in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Overriding principle, we're going to say. Jesus said, I did not come to be ministered to, I came to minister. He said, I didn't come to have my needs met, I came to give my life as a ransom for many. Now, not, not in a religious way, but in a very real way, at that point, Jesus Jesus was dying to himself. The apostle John got it when he said, Jesus must increase and I must decrease. So I would say to you this morning, manifesting son, manifesting daughter of God, that the crucifixion begins with us doing the same as Jesus, which is to die to ourself. Now I'm not talking about, that, that right there triggered some of you because you're thinking about the old religious training on dying to yourself where you beat your flesh into subjection. You tried to, you know, uh, sacrifice and you hurt yourself uh, all kind of ways trying to prove that, that you, were, you were dying to self. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is a decrease in our, our motivation for us a manifested son knows that God's going to take care of him. God's going to meet his needs. And so what, what, we're, what we're doing is decreasing, as, as Jesus did, and we're going to read it in just a minute, decreasing that he might increase through us. It says in, what is it, Romans 6, 4, that if we were buried with him in baptism, right? Symbology, we died. When Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan, he came up a different person. He came up, and as soon as he got out of the water, the voice from heaven said, that's my boy. That's my beloved son. I'm well pleased with him. More about that in just a minute. But it was no longer the boy Jesus, the young man Jesus. It was now the son of God being sent into the world to accomplish his mission of totally reflecting the father. All right? So the first thing is this. First thing is this. This is what Jesus demonstrated. If we're going to manifest as a son of God, then we have to do, number one, we gotta do something with our minds. Because this is where the trip up is. This, is. this is what has held us back in days gone by. It's the mind. Philippians chapter two, let me just read it for you. Philippians chapter two, and you've, you've probably heard this a gazillion times. Philippians chapter two and verse Five, which is at the very beginning of the chapter, says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. 
It's, it's a permission. You have to begin to say, my mind, my mind is not sufficient. We, we're not coming to do the sufficiency of ourselves. Our sufficiency is of God who's made us able ministers. And to get to that uh, uh, able minister, we got to do something with our head. I know you've heard a lot of teaching on renewing your mind. I'm going to go beyond that. I'm telling you, you need to function with the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. It's the, it's the mind that Jesus functions functioned out of Jesus had the mind of Christ. The eternal Christ became the mind of this guy, Jesus. And I can't separate Jesus' humanity from his divinity. He was 100% human, 100% divine. They all come together in one man. But just for the sake of teaching this morning, I want you to understand something. Jesus Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. He learned to function out of that mind that he had. He grew in it, and you and I are growing into it as well. Now, what, what do I mean when I say that we have the mind of Christ? Listen to me carefully. The mind of Christ always thinks, listen, thinks in full synchronization with the Father. That's why Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father do, only say what I hear the Father say. He was functioning out of the mind of Christ. Now, this is going to get some of you mad. <laughs> verse 6, verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And verse 6 says, Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. He was in the form of God and did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now, that's how the mind thought. Verse 6 is not another whole new topic. He doesn't start a whole nother, nother discussion here. He says in verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. How did that mind think? Did not think it uh, uh, wrong or a sham to be considered equal with God. Now, what again, what does that mean? It means equal in form and likeness. It says, who being in the form of God. He understood form and light. I want you to understand form and likeness this morning. The deity of Jesus did not subtract or steal from the Father being center stage. Jesus yielded to the Father. John 14, long about verse 28, 29, Jesus actually said, the Father is greater than I am. How could that be? They're both God. There is a divine order that's going on here now. Hear, hear me again. I, I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to hear me say things I'm not saying this morning. Mind of Christ you have. Not, not to be uh, looked down upon. Did, don't, don't consider it uh, wrong to be equal with God in this. You have a mind that is in full synchronization with the Father. You're not just a human. You're not just a human. Jesus was not a human. Jesus was 100% human and 100% God. The new creation and what Malcolm was driving at, the new creation has a divine nature. Now you are not God. You are not the creator of the universe. You are not first cause, but you do have a divine nature. You are a chip off the old block. You're a cup out of the ocean that contains all of the properties, all of the elements of the whole, but you are not the whole. The humanity of Jesus did not detract from his deity, and his deity did not detract from his humanity. Now, there's a divine order to this. That's what I was going to get into. Jesus fully reflected the Father. The Father is greater than all. Jesus fully reflected the Father. The Holy Spirit, which is just as much God as Jesus and the Father, always points to Jesus. Now here you come along, right? You're in the circle. You're part of the family. You're part of the group. But your divine order is not to be the Father or to be Jesus. Nor are you the Holy Spirit. You are you, but you have a divine nature. And you have a unique call. You have, a, you have an ability that nobody else on the planet has. You have a, a fingerprint that nobody else has, which is an indication that God made you special, made you unique. You are one with Jesus. You are one with the Father. You are one with the Holy Spirit, and yet you're unique. You're unique, just as each of them are unique. But what I'm driving home is you have to begin to get your mind to think in a way that, yes, I, I am of a divine essence. 
I, I am part of this, this deification process that the Father has brought me into, so much so that Paul said that in Jesus dwelt the fullness of the Godhead in one bodily form. Contemplate that. In this one man, Jesus was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then verse 10, he comes along and says, and you are complete in him. You know what he's saying? I hope this isn't too descriptive. He's saying that you and Jesus are Siamese twins. You're connected to him. There is the same, there is the same flow between one and the other. I'm not an expert on Siamese twins, but I understand they share, they share the same blood flow. In some cases, they even share the same organs. And it gets tricky when you, when you separate Siamese twins. You, you, you better be an expert. It takes hours of surgery. See, because they're, they were basically designed to be inseparable. And you have been designed to be inseparable. Religious came along, did a surgery on you, and made you feel separated now. And I'm telling you, it's time that we come back to this. Now, here's the mind of Christ is functioning in you. Are you, are you with me so far? 1 Corinthians 2.16 says, we have the mind of Christ. So don't debate it. Accept it. That's why I meant when we're studying nuts and bolts, some of you still are having a problem thinking that the mind that Jesus had, you have also. That means you have a mind that can consider all things possible. That means that you have a mind that is outside the box. That means that you have a mind that is pliable and workable by the spirit of truth. So you have the mind of Christ. You understand, you understand I'm not, I'm going to, I've been hitting on point number two a little bit, but I'm, I'm going to move off of it right now. Here's how it looks. Here's how it looks. All right. Here's how it looks. He, Jesus knew who he was, had no problem with, with his identity. But in verse 7 of, of, of uh, Philippians chapter 2, it begins to show the mind that he had. Now watch. This is, this, is when you, this is what I was referring to when I was talking about dying to yourself. All right? It's not the old religious concept. Forget that. Forget that. Here's what it looks like. Made himself of no reputation. Boy, if there's anybody who could have been a man of reputation, it would have been Jesus. He could have shown up on the planet and told everybody, you know who you're dealing with? Do you know who you're refuting, arguing with? Do you know who you're hanging on the cross? He made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of a man and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the, even the death of the cross. So how does that mind of Christ begin to function? All right, it knows that it has the mind of Christ, does not uh, consider it robbery, knows his mind is in full synchronization with the Father, but he's willing to make himself a no reputation. That means that you begin to consider others than yourself. You're not always after self-interest. I'm not saying you shouldn't have self-interest. Uh, scripture says man shouldn't think more highly of himself than he should, and I don't find that the problem with most. I find the problem with most is they think less of themselves than what they should. Made himself no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant. See, the mind of Christ grasps an important truth. Are you, are you listening? The mind of Christ understands that it is a son by position, but a servant by manifestation. So when you look at a manifesting son of God, I ask you, what, what does it look like? When you look at a manifesting son of God, it look, he looks like a servant. He's coming and he's serving everybody. He's not looking for somebody to, to serve him. He's not looking to get advantage on somebody, right? Manifesting is a big topic right now, even, even among uh, New Thought people. But they're, they're always looking to manifest something for themselves, you know, a, a gain of some kind. A manifesting son of God is not looking for that kind of gain. And I, I tell you, they contain a certain level of truth on manifesting, helping you to manifest. And I'm not against that health or finances. There's, there's a place for that. I did a series on you're a creator. There's a place for that. But I'm, what I want to tell you this morning is if the system of manifesting isn't manifesting the Son, if it's not Christ-centered, then I'd be very careful of it. I'd watch out for it. I'd, I'd kind of walk around a little bit. The proof of the kingdom 
and the manifestation is always a, a Christ-centered, a Christ-reflecting manifestation. All right, I got to hurry along this morning. Number two, number two, if as we manifest as a, as a son like Jesus, right? did you get something out of that mind thing? I think I laid some nuggets out there. I laid some truth for you that <clears throat> you can begin to practice. And that's what I'm after here. We need to practice present truth. It, it can't, it's got to get beyond a concept or a theory or a theology. It's got to get into us and take root enough that we begin to walk it out. And I'm not talking about a flesh effort. I'm talking about let his grace do the effortless change. The sufficient, see we read 2 Corinthians 3, 5, and 6. Sufficiency is not of ourself. The sufficiency is from him who has made us able ministers of the new covenant. Not of the, not of the, of the law, but of the spirit. The law is the ministry of death. The spirit is the ministry of life. All right, number two. Here's the second thing I want to get across this morning. I got just about 15 minutes or so. Are you ready? We, like Jesus, have to have a sense of authentic identity. What is your authentic identity? Who, you, who are you really? Jesus had a good sense. I, I love what Jesus said here. In John chapter 17, and verse 24, Jesus, Jesus made a statement. I want, when I'm done with this statement, I'm going to show from Scripture that you should make the same statement as well. Here's what Jesus said. Here, here's, here's, here was the key to Jesus knowing his authentic identity. He said, Father, he's praying, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. So Jesus was saying his sufficiency wasn't of himself. His sufficiency came from God. He's just phrasing a little different. Behold my glory, which you have given me. Now watch, watch what he says. This, this was the root in Jesus. You have loved me before the foundation of the world. You have loved me before the foundation of the world. Christ's got a hold of that identity. See, when you know that the Father loves you from the foundation of the world, man, you talk about security. I understand, you know, there's once saved, always saved. This, this is a whole lot better than once saved, always saved. We all need to know exactly what Jesus confessed about himself. It was so ingrained into Jesus. He so understood it. He so demonstrated it that it bore the fruit. Now, here's what I, I have become convinced of. And this took me a long time because of my religious background. I am convinced, and I want you to be convinced. I was convinced that I was a beloved son way before I became a Christ follower. Way before. Jesus said that the Father loved him before the foundation of the world. You know, what, you know what the Bible says? Let me, let me just, I'm going to hit you with three fast scriptures. I don't have time to comment on them, but let me, let me just read these because Paul is passing this same truth on to you this morning. Ephesians chapter 1 and, and verse 5. It says, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ, to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. He predestined you to be a son. Now, if, if that doesn't light your fire enough to know that you have been predestined to manifest as a son, you will, you will manifest as a son. It may take some of the hard heads a few eons of time, but you will get there. You will be a full disclosure of Jesus, all right? If that, did, if that didn't get through to you, how about this? Verse Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. He foreknew every one of us. Every single one of you. Every, every Susie, Billy, John, Jack, Betty Lou, whoever you are. He foreknew you. And those that he foreknew, he predestined, it says... He predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He ain't going to stop till that conformity is done. Now, he doesn't stop there. Be conformed to the image of his son that Jesus might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, watch this. Moreover, whom he predestined, those that he foreknew, he also called. Whom he called, he also justified. And those that he justified, he glorified. So here's the progression. This is what I believe we're, we're in today. 
He foreknew. He predestined. He then uh, uh, called. He then justified. And then he glorified. Do you see the process there? Now, that's Romans chapter 8, verse 28 to 31. That takes it every single one of us, y'all. There's nobody left outside that scope. We, we all are in, in that process. See, second, let me give you one more. I said I wasn't going to commentary them. They speak for themselves. Second Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. This is so rich. I wished I had seen this 50 years ago. It says that he saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose, which we just read in Romans chapter 8. For new, predestined, called, justified, glorified. Right? Called us with the whole, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ before time began but is now being revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So everything that God gave us before time is now being shown to us in the life of Jesus. I suggest you go back through the Gospels. Study the life, nothing wrong with studying the life of Jesus. I understand he was pre-cross. Nothing wrong with studying the life of Jesus. He, he's showing us what the Son looks like in full manifestation. But what I wanted you to see, he saved us, called us with the holy calling, according to the grace which was given to us before time began. So this, this whole thing has been a done deal. The mind of Christ, point one, is, is I think so essential. Right? The over overruling umbrella on this is that we didn't come to be ministered to, we come to minister. Now once, you're, once you've crossed that, that chasm and you're willing to lay your life down for other people, doesn't mean you abuse yourself, but it means you're decreasing, he's increasing means where you see a need, you're able to meet it. I'll, I want to get into next week so bad. You meet it. See, what's, what's happened is your, your years of religious training clouded the eyes of your dust man. They told you you were just a dust man. You're just a human. And, and if you, you better hope that you measure up because God's going to look at you someday and going to judge you. He's already judged you. He already said, I, I, I foreknew you. I predestined you, I called you, I justified you, I glorified you, and it was according to the grace that I distributed to you before time even began. Let me say it again. Being Jesus, the man, did not detract from his Christness nor his divinity. They were one package. You being Billy, Susie, Fred, Annabelle, whatever your name is, you being that human does not detract from your divinity, doesn't take away from your divine nature. Your humanness gives you, are you listening? Gives you a unique expression of your humanness. Who you are gives a Christness a unique expression. Now, here's where a lot of people miss it. Man, I'm running out of time. If I go over a little bit this morning, you need to click off, just go. I've got to finish this. This is burning in me. Now, here's where some of us miss it. We wash out, we give up, we quit. That, that identity that you've come to understand to some level, all right, some level. I don't think we've all grasped it yet. Some level. It's going to be tried. It's going to be tested. That's the pattern. That's the thread through Scripture. Paul with the thorn in the fresh, Moses on the backside of the desert, uh, Jesus in Luke 3, he was baptized, his identity was secured, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I'm telling you, if the heavens opened up one day, you're driving, you're driving to the store, heavens opened up, voice comes from heaven, dove flies down, voice everybody around you hears, that's my boy right there, that's my girl in whom I'm well pleased. That would establish your identity, sonship. That's my son, that's my daughter, whom I'm well pleased. As soon as that happened, as soon as that happened, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness and his identity was challenged. He fasted 40 days. It says Satan, whatever you want to make Satan to be, I believe it was a head trip personally. He was hungry. 
And the natural thinking of hunger is turn those stones into bread. If the, the temptation was this, if you are the son of God, and that's what all the three temptations were. If you are the son, if you are the, if you are who you claim to be, then do this. It was tested. Now the 14th verse of that, of that third chapter, of the fourth chapter, I'm sorry, he ended up baptized in chapter three, was led by the spirit in the wilderness, chapter four. In verse 14, it says, he left the desert in the power of the spirit. Now watch. The spirit led him into the wilderness to have his identity tested. And it's going to happen to you too. There's no testimony without a test. There's no victory without a battle, right? So there's, you got this identity. And maybe that's why some of us are afraid that, that if we expose ourselves, come out of the closet, we don't know what we're going to face. Fair enough. I get it. But he came out in the power of the spirit. Then his ministry started. His ministry didn't start till he began to grow in wisdom, stature, and favor, demonstrated the mind of Christ, had a secured identity at his baptism, went into the wilderness and had his identity challenged. Now, out of the mind of Christ and that established identity, the God-ordained purpose of Jesus and your God-ordained purpose is going to begin to surface. And it's that it, he, it's, it's coming out in the power of the Spirit when you know that you know that you know who you are. You've withstood the test. It's hit you with everything that it can hit you with and you haven't backed up. I, maybe that's why I'm doing these nuts and bolts because until we get this... Uh, until we get this issue of the mind of Christ and authentic identity established, we're not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. Honestly, you don't have anything to manifest except human natural wisdom and the works of the flesh, which is human ideology, until you get the mind of Christ functioning and get your identity established. Digital Cathedral, we're being pulled in another dimension. We're being pulled in another direction. Identity as divinity creates a consciousness that like Jesus, hear me carefully, allows you to live in two dimensions at one time. John chapter 18, verse 36, Jesus said, I'm not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. If it had been of this world, they would have all taken up swords and we'd have had a battle on our hands. Then one chapter earlier in John chapter 17, verse 15, 16, when Jesus is praying, he said, Father, I, I ask that you'd show them that even as I'm not of this world, they're not of this world. What's he, what's he praying? He's saying, I'm praying that they can function in two realms, in two dimensions. What we're doing and we're learning at the digital cathedral is that we're pulling out of the limitations of the world. We've lived in the limitations of the world our entire life. And the present truth that is coming to us now is enabling us and giving us revelation, understanding that we're pulling out. We're going back. We're going into a dimension we've never lived in before. Jesus is teaching us. Do you know, you know why we never explored these things back in our day, back in why well, I didn't as a pastor? Well, first of all, I didn't know it. Had no idea. And the Spirit of God couldn't reveal it to me because like the disciples, I wasn't ready to receive it. I'd have rejected it. Religion kept you earthbound. Religion kept you in this dimension for two very specific reasons. They wanted to, to, to press on you through fear and, and just trepidation that the rapture could happen anytime. They prepared you to leave. Jesus never talked about leaving. He said, Father, I don't pray you take them out of the world. I just pray you, you show them how to keep from the evil of the world. So the, the church has prepared us for something that Jesus prayed against. And the second reason why they kept us earthbound is because we were looking for Jesus to come back and open up a can of whoop ass on all our enemies. Finally get vengeance. Finally take care of them. See, that's, that's what the disciples were looking for. Jesus to establish a kingdom that would take vengeance out on the Romans. But what is breaking forth today globally is, is an invasion of spirit consciousness. We're beginning to see everything with a new lens. In other words, heaven is now invading earth. The two dimensions are becoming one. And you're being prepared to live in both dimensions at once, even as Jesus did. Now, he's teaching us through a lot of different means. I think, personally, I think 
the quantum world is going to explain to us a lot of what ha of what's happening in the spirit world because the two are coming together. We're not we're not opposed to science, and science shouldn't be opposed to spirituality. Science should be help helping us explain some of the mysteries that maybe we didn't see before. See, you came out of the work of religion. You came out of the do 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 do, and you have been you've been put into the realm of the done. Paul put it like this. You have been delivered from the power of darkness and you have been translated into the kingdom of God's dear son. So two things have started to happen. And I got to start parking this bus. You begin to see things you never saw before. You begin to live with the freedom you never had before. You begin to open up to ideas and understanding that before would have been considered heresy. And you begin to see who God has designed you to be. One of my favorite scriptures that changed my life 20 years ago. One of the ones he showed me that I've read a gazillion times was this, Ephesians 2.10, listen. And I'm saying this straight to you this morning that are listening to me here to Digital Cathedral. For you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he has before ordained. Did you get that? You're a piece of work that was created in Christ Jesus. Nobody told me I was created in Christ Jesus. They told me I was created in Adam. I was, I was created lost and undone, headed for an eternal torture chamber. Nobody told me I was created in Christ Jesus. Nobody told me Ephesians 1, 4, that he chose me in Christ before the foundation of the world. Nobody told me that. So you're beginning to think outside of the former religious box. And I realize that can be a little bit scary. I think some of you have stepped over the line. You're not scared anymore. You realize perfect love casts out fear. But for some of you, it's a little bit, a little bit scary. You're moving into places you've never been before. You're starting to understand Mark 11, 23. You're starting to understand that when you, when you begin to proclaim and you live out of the mind of Christ and out of an identity, the things that you pray, that you desire, they begin to come to pass. The problem is a lot of us have pulled back. Some of us have pulled back. I've watched people pull back. The way you fall out of this message is to go back under law, to go back under religion. And I think I better, I better stop right there. I just better cut it. I think we've gone over a lot of territory this morning, covered a lot of ground. Next week, I'm going to hit the third area, which is how do you begin to function as a manifested son? How do you, how do you begin to put boots on the ground? I want you to think this week. I want you to go on a back porch in the evening. And I want you to think about the mind of Christ, which you possess. We've shown that this morning. I want you to think about the depth of your authentic identity as divinity. I want that to just pull into you. I want you to absorb that into you. I want you to give it place within you that you might begin to see who you are. Let the mind of Christ reveal it. That he will reveal. That's the purpose of the mind of Christ. That's why I took it first. It's fundamental. It'll show you authentic identity. And it will begin to show you how you begin as a manifested son of God, which we'll cover next week. Thank you for being with me this morning. You guys are awesome. I appreciate every single one of you. This is a growing community. We have almost 6,000 subscribers to this channel. We have a couple thousand people that watch the teaching throughout the week. So it's an important worldwide ministry and you're part of it. I appreciate those of you that put skin in the game, that keep us encouraged and supported through prayer, through contributions that you say, go man, go. You're part of that cloud of witnesses here on the earth. And I appreciate it so much. See you Wednesday night at the book study. If you don't have a copy, get Religion Busters on Amazon. Come on over and join us. You won't be sorry you did, I guarantee you. See you next week. God bless. If this teaching resonates with you and you would like to partner with us in our expanding efforts to take this message of grace and union around the world, you may make a donation at donkeithley.com. We thank you for your continued support and encouragement.